You know. Dude, I was I was listening to um you and Dave O'Neill last night. I was taking the kids to bounce, and on the way home, they were like, "We want to listen to kids songs." I was like, "I'm listening to Billy and Dave O'Neill. I've got a big podcast tomorrow, boys. We've got to get ready." The um right. Mate, the that's debrief. Nightmare. That's a nightmare for kids, isn't it? Yeah, remember well, it's a nightmare. A, for... Remember when you're a kid and you have to listen to what your parents want, like, and it's hell, personal hell, isn't it? <laughs> you got... You got a good memory of like childhood um, memories, like childhood experiences. I was thinking that yesterday when you were talking on the podcast about how you used to have a teacher who lived in the roof of your school. Like, I reckon yeah, you yeah. tap in nicely to the emotions of what it was like as a kid. Some people um, forget that. I'm really sentimental. I just got back from Perth and I used to live yeah. there for like six years when I was a kid. And I was just driving around doing all these sentimental tours and reminiscing on like the smallest details. And I called Jessie. Um, She's like, What are you doing? I'm like, Oh, babe, I'll just looking at my old primary school where I used to do chin-ups at recess. And she's like, I'm so glad I'm not on this holiday with you. It sounds so shit. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm like that. What's the word for it? Um, when uh, nostalgic, um, I, my, my primary school got knocked down, mate, and I still think about it at least once a week. I'm shattered because I, I think well, primary school is when you're at your purest form of, of, as a human. Like, I've never been happier than grade six, man. Like so, I had the world, I had the world at my feet, and life hadn't got complicated yet. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> I was captain of the footy team, the cricket team, the house captain. People liked me. What else do you need, man? <laughs> <laughs> it is true. There's like an innocence to. I don't know what age it stopped. Like I went out for a run this morning, and I was even thinking. I remember I used to go to a church, and I looked mm-hmm. at the lead pastor of our church at City Life. And this is only like, I must have been 22, and he Mm. would have been 50. And I looked at him, and I was like, oh, yeah, I reckon, okay, if I could just be like a head pastor of a church, then everything just works out good. And it's funny how all of a sudden, like, you're pushing towards the age that you're looking Mm. at this bloke who's apparently living the dream life, and you realize it's like, oh, okay, so there's never actually one point in time where everything's all together, and you've absolutely Mm. nailed it. Like, I've never got to a point, even with the things that I um that I was like aiming towards, whether it was my running or whatever, yeah. where I go, okay, if I run eight minutes, up, I, I remember thinking, okay, I want to break nine minutes for 3K. If I run nine minutes for 3K, then I'll be good. Then I run mm. nine minutes. I was like, yeah, but there's some blokes running 8.05. <laughs> Funny how yeah, it never, changes, hey? You're never happy with, when you always want more. I'm very wary of it. But like, I just remember being young in primary school and just me and my mate, Scott Williamson, just eating the apples in the backyard and we were happy as like, We'll just eat an apple, just throwing the apple cores into trees and that. And like, life, like, there's no better. Th- I don't think I'm ever going to be as happy as I was in grade six. I just don't think I will be. And it doesn't matter what I achieve because you just realize life, I don't know, that's just the best time. You got BMXs, you're just riding around, you're fit as. So you naturally fit just from being a kid. You don't, no one has to tell you to train. When you're an adult, someone has to go, hey, you've got to go to gym tonight, mate. Or you're in dry, and you can't eat that. But as a kid, you're like, I eat what I want. I just do five hours of exercise a day, and that's easy. <laughs> it, yeah, it's like the play factor in it, isn't it? It's the play factor, dude. I, man, I had the biggest, I had the coolest moment today. Like, uh, yeah, active morning. I um, I've got like a little cruiser skateboard, and I'm yeah. trying to bring a bit of play back in for the reasons that you're saying. Because I'm so disciplined. I'll go to the gym. I'll mm. go for a run. I'll do all the stuff I have to, even mm. if I hate it. Yeah. Because uh, you're so right. When you're a kid, just cruising around the BMX track, you're the fittest kid in the whole world, and you're just pissing yeah. yourself laughing the whole time you're doing it. But um, yeah. yeah, I'm trying to introduce a bit more of that back in. Like I, I had my kid, my little three year old boy, just um, held him under one arm today. I just skated him to daycare, and mm. I was like, dude, this is this is what exercise. I I'm not sure if it's supposed to be that because that that could be mm. illegal. I'm not sure it was definitely unsafe. Pretty illegal. But I was taking him to school, going, mate, you've got not only have you got the coolest dad. But this is how fun exercise should be. Yeah, you're. I mean, I think that's probably the most illegal thing you've ever done. But um, <laughs> it's funny. I was down at. I did a gig down at Garfield um, the other week, and I bumped into these girls. And one of them was like Gary Ablett's uh, cousin or niece or something. Um, senior or junior? Well, probably senior's niece and junior's cousin, I guess. And um, I said to her. Have you got the ablet speed that they all have? Because they're all quick. 
I go, have you got it? She's like, yeah, I had it when I was young. And, I, and, the fun, and then she goes, and, and this comes back to being a kid still. She goes, me and my friend play, the, we play, we, they're in their 40s, and they play gang, uh, touch, piggy, what tag. And, and they still play it. There's a movie where some guys in America do that still. And they tag each other at their weddings and stuff like that. And you have to, and this girl got Dave O'Neill to tag her friend. So they still play it. So that, they, And she said the same thing. She's like, you get sick of being an adult. You know what I mean? Like, why do we have to, you, know, you go, you leave school when you're 18 and, and all of a sudden it's like, now you got to just be a full on adult. It's like, I can't. I'm not trained for that. I'm trained to <laughs> climb trees, man. Like I always say to people, if I get mega rich, I'm just making the best tree house anyone's ever seen. Dude, that's so good. I'm coming over. I'm coming over all the time. A, it's going to have like box towel. It'll probably have like a stage, two gigs there. You know, but you've got. To, I'm, I'm the biggest kid. I, I don't want to grow up. Man. Yeah, I, I'm nostalgic. I think I'm the most nostalgic person. I, like, I still remember. Pe- like, I remember petrol pump numbers by footy players from the '80s. <laughs> like I, you know how you put petrol in and, and they go what number and I'll be like Tony Modra number six that's right or <laughs> Wayne Johnston number seven Robert Flower number two I, that's how I remember stuff and it, I think yeah mate the best memories come from that I get the biggest buzz when I put a footy song on from the 90s you know like that's how I feel when when that because they say when you Try and maintain a good feeling, and that's always for me. It's always like <laughs> you, you need to get yourself in flow state for things, and I do it for comedy a bit. But the main one of the moments I, I I think about to get myself in a good feeling is when when Grimshaw Primary School beat Norris Bank by five points. I kicked the steal up, and we were just bus ride home back to our school. Best day of my life, mate. Like because they we weren't expected to beat them. And that, so I go back to not the eighties just for a good feeling. You know what I mean? Like, a, what, isn't that mental? Good, like, yeah. where do you? Where would you? If you had to find a good feeling, right? So I know you got married, had kids. They're great. Apart from that, if you, if someone said, if you went to a psychologist and they said, find a good feeling, where are you going? That's a so, very good question. I reckon, honestly, I go back to like, um, remember how fun Christmas is when you're a kid? Oh, oh the ultimate. It's you're a up dude, all night. I, I remember living in Perth, right? And I, I would have been eight or nine. Yeah, you're up all night. And I remember, I can't remember exactly how many days before it was, but say it was, it might have even been the day before. But I remember going to my mate's house, his name's Shuey. And we were both like, oh, this day is taking forever. Like, tomorrow's oh. Christmas. Like, what are we yeah. going to do? And I remember going to his house and just watching Face Off. And we watched like five different movies just to try and make the day go fast. And then, <laughs> dude, I've got, I've got like photos. I've got a little photo album over here. But I've got photos of myself even when I'm too old. I, I reckon I was like 12. Like the excitement of yeah. Christmas should have worn off a little bit by then maybe. Yeah. And I'm sitting on my new Haro bike, my, my BMX mm. bike, which I knew I was getting. Yeah. Like I knew mum bought it. I didn't even believe in Santa at this stage. But still, I woke mm. up and I was like, I can't believe it. And then it's weird as you get older as well, because like gradually each Christmas after you turn twelve, you gradually mm. like, oh, it's it's not as good as last year. And now yeah. I'm thirty six, and when you get up for Christmas morning, it's just another day, really. Like it's good to see everyone, but mm. chances are I'm just going to get in an argument with my auntie about COVID, and mm. that's going to be the highlight of the day. Whereas when you're a kid, it was just about lollies, BMX bikes, and showing your mates what you got. Oh mate, yeah, yeah, Christmas. I was trying to believe in Santa ages after i knew he was fake i was like nah i was denying it i'm like he's real mate it was like wrestling um but i remember one year my sister my sister bought me a present it was under the tree i'm like what is it like how just tell me and, and it was just a, it was a big massive box and i was excited i'm like what is she got me she hasn't got that much money surely and then on the day it was just it was just a cricket ball but i was wrapped with that <laughs> like I, it was just a cricket ball, like even not even a proper one. Like I think one of those sport cricket balls I used to have. I don't know if I still got them, but yeah, Christmas, man, the best ever. Uh, yeah, great time. Isn't it? There's no real. I we, we had a good time growing up. 
you're a bit younger than me, but everyone's on computer games 24-7 now, whereas we weren't allowed to. Like, we had to do other stuff. It was better. Dude, I took my TV out of my lounge room the other day just because it was doing my head in how much oh. TV my little boys were watching. But it's not their fault. I mean, I, it was mainly me because my older boy is a legend. Love him, but he's so full on. Like he's he's kind of like me. He's mm. a perfect combination of me and my wife, which sort of makes sense. But he's so how intense. Is he? He's three, just turned three. Yeah, and he's like the unbelievable amount of energy. It's just it's mind blowing. And every now and he's kind of needy too. So every now and then I'm like, I just want time to myself. I don't want to hang out with you. I'll just put a kids show mm. on. And yeah. then, dude, I was putting so many kids shows on. I was realizing like, holy crap, this is it's because it's the best babysitter. I get I get why pe- parents do it. Even though I used to judge them mm. so hard. When I used to see it before I had kids, I was like, oh, man, it's so bad how much screen time you give your kid. And then I had yeah. a kid. I'm like, I'm so – like, I totally get it. And so you I put it. that on. Anyway, Jesse read some Instagram post the other day about some chick who threw out her TV. And she was like, it was actually a way easier transition than what I thought. And so we've been telling him that our TV has gone to the doctors to get, to get fixed or whatever. It's just under a sheet in our garage. And I'm kind of enjoying it for the reasons you just said. It's like, I don't, mm. I just watch it sometimes because it's there. It's like, I got my phone mm. next to me. And sometimes while I was waiting for you, I just looked at Instagram and I didn't even, I didn't even want to see anything. I was just, I was just going to see if anything was going on. And yeah. it really is. I, yeah. I've, um, I don't turn, I've never turned the TV on for years. I don't watch it at all. But I do, I was scrolling a lot, but I've, cut, I've even given up scrolling now. I don't want to know. I, there's too much in my head, especially what we went through over the last few years. I'm like, I don't even want to know. Whatever. Ignorance is bliss. You know what I mean? I'm ignorant. Sorry, guys. I don't know that there's a war somewhere in the world that's probably been going on for 50 years anyway. Like, I don't want to know. I don't have to know. There's nothing I can do about it. So I watch. If there's a sporting event I need to watch, i watch. But I can't help world problems. The news depresses the shit out of me. Like, Put something good on it. Is the world all just sad? You know, I'm pretty sure it's not, but that's what we're copping on that box. Yeah, we? I, I listened to this podcast ages ago with Rich Roll, and he was talking to, I think he was talking to Andrew Huberman, and Andrew Huberman was like, hey, guess what emotion people like to feel the most? And Rich Roll was like, happiness? And I was like, that's a good guess. Like, that's probably what I'm pursuing. That's what I feel like I'm after. And he's like, yeah, but if a person's got the opportunity to go towards happiness or mild irritation, they tend towards mild mild irritation every time. I'm like, oh, mm. that makes sense then. That like, because if the goal of a a news show is to sell advertising, which I guess it is, then like mm. the best state to keep people hanging around is just put them in mild irritation. And like the best way to do that is like, hey, here's um, here's Israel Palestine. Here's I'm still trying to figure out. I've been thinking about this lately. Like I can't keep up with. The news as it is, like I'm just starting to get my head around who I'm going for in the Russia versus Ukraine war, and now they're telling yeah. me I got to pick sides on another one, I, 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 dude. And you're right. Like, what am I going to do? Even if I can tell you all about Israel and Palestine, who cares? Apart from me just being able to look good to you and hold a conversation, and it's like a good dinner party trick. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not doing anything to help it. No, and then and I'm not getting all the information. I don't know all the information. I can't get all the information. Doesn't matter if I have all the information. It doesn't matter who I want to win the war. There shouldn't be a fucking war, for yeah. one. If that's the only way we can deal with shit, still, humans are disgusting. Like they haven't yeah. come very far. That they humans are still killing each other. But I'm not allowed to say certain words on stage because <laughs> it offends people. So, that's yeah, so true. Work it out. Like and then hey. These people that do the start these wars, they went to fucking uni. I didn't. And I still know that killing people is wrong. Like, it's re- humans, mate, the only animal that doesn't know how to exist. You know? yeah. My dad Isn't used to always say to me, he used to always go, um, he goes, I would, I would, no matter what you did, I would never, ever go to war. And if everyone thought like me, there would never be a war. And I'm like, mm-hmm. it sounds so basic, but it's so true. If but, you then, say no. but then... Yeah, but then I'm also like, all right, but the only the only challenge I have to that argument is if like the the Japanese start flying over Melbourne and start trying mm. to drop bombs on us and start hurting my kids, then I go, well, maybe I would because mm. that but would fire me on, up. You'd fight then, but you're not going to an official one where it's like an organised war. Like it should 
if, it, if, I, if it's just about who's the strongest, let's do it in the ring then. Let's do it in, like, put the two, get your toughest man from each country and let them fight. Then give them, because no one, no one ever hands it over anyway, whatever they want it. I don't understand it. I never will, probably. Bro, um, that's your David and Goliath story. Bring that back. Pick your biggest soldier or your yeah. most equipped shoulder and let them fight it out. I like it. I don't get how, like, the leaders of these countries, what happens at, when they go home to their wife at the end of the day, like, yeah, it was work, you know, like tough day. Like, how do they sleep? What's going on with them? Like, re- yeah. Mental. Do you reckon there's comfort in numbers? It's one of those things. It's like, I I always get this feeling that if, if you're surrounded by enough people who either justify a certain thing or are getting enough of a payout to be able to find justification for it, it gets way easier to justify yeah. it. Like, I've often yeah. seen it. Like your old man said, he wouldn't go to war. But you know what happens if you don't go to war when you get conscripted? You get called a coward by everyone. Like my uncle didn't go to war. He had to go to jail. Yeah. He got he, his birthday got called out to Vietnam, and um, he didn't go. But you, you copped a bit of flack for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you're a coward, you're a coward not fighting for your country. But he, he's the same. He's like, I don't. Why should I go to war? Don't you reckon it's weird? Like, you're a coward for an hour. Muhammad Ali didn't go to the Vietnam War for the same reason. He wasn't allowed to box. Mm. Mm. And then now we look back at him as not only the greatest boxer of all time, but someone who stood for things so much greater. It's weird how, like, in a particular era, like, during the time, maybe use the COVID example. Like, we're, it's not mm. – I mean, the idea of being called a coward doesn't doesn't really bother me anymore. But, um, like mm. – but who knows in 50 years, already people start to look back at that and they're like, oh, no, now I feel like I can see where you're coming from with the vaccine. But but way beyond that, like going to a war, mm. I feel like no one looks at Muhammad Ali now and be like, oh, yeah, he should have gone, really. Like it was for yeah, a good cause. Now we yeah, look it's back. Yeah, it's like it time, time sorts it out. Um, it's like any argument. Sometimes you have an argument with someone and you walk away and go, oh, I was a bit harsh. Yeah. I went to hard at that me. person. And I can't, you know what they reckon about arguments? They reckon when you have an argument with somebody, you're actually arguing to convince yourself that you're right. How's that? That's probably true. Because people that know they're right don't talk. They're like, okay, idiot, I'm not talking. This argument's over. Like, but if you're actually going hard at them, you're, going, you're trying to convince them to agree with you and you to so then convince yourself that you're actually right, but you don't even know. That's Next so time good, someone's hey. arguing with you, go, you don't even know. So, yeah. <laughs> or you just sit there quiet and then send them a text message about what you just said, and they're like, mm. oh, he was so quiet. He must know he's right. I'm going to change my mm-hmm. opinion. Well, that's right. Well, when you have an argument with your girlfriend or your wife or whatever, and she just stops talking, you go away and go, man, she got me again. <laughs> 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 it's so yeah. true and that's yeah. like her tactic the silent treatment it just it makes yeah. you say more dumb stuff doesn't it like if i start getting but, silent treatment it just yeah. nothing makes me more angry no nah, you start they've got you on the ropes and you start spitting stuff out it's like when they're coming at you hard you've got to do the same you've got to go quiet and just take the punches and then but if you sometimes they just keep punching for so long that you say something you don't even mean that and then you're in trouble because they're like oh got you now you just my mate my mate works for ANZ Bank. I don't know if I've told you about him before, Joash. And he was telling uh, me he just got made redundant a, a few weeks ago. He's been with him for like 15 years. Mm. Um, and he's a smart guy. And he was saying in the interview, because they were still doing it like this, they were still doing it behind a computer. And yeah. he said that he read recently that one of the best ways to get people to overshare or to share yeah. more information than they should is – to sit back and just be quiet. And so he had a, he, yeah, he had Mm. a half an hour meeting scheduled with this guy and the guy goes, Oh, how are you, Joash? And he goes, good. And was, he's a soup, like he's a fairly personable guy. So we'll start Mm. talking. And so he reckons as soon as he said, good, he saw his boss's eyes be like, Oh, so, and then the guy just started rambling and he's like, Oh, I got a front row seat at, at what that's like, I'll be like that. Like if you went quiet yeah. on me right now, mate, I'll fill the next 10 minutes up with mm. all my issues and bullshit. You would never want to talk to me again because I would have overshared accidentally. Yeah, 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 I know. Like it's interesting how you can prompt a person to talk. 
Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you just that's what you do in um counseling. I did a counseling course once and um I didn't finish it like every other course I've started, but <laughs> one of the things you don't like I like to think counselors must give you answers, but they actually don't. They make you find them. So they just go, Oh yeah, tell me more and then they just sit there. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, Okay, I better come up with some more stuff. So when I was 18, this happened. And you're like, why am I even telling her this? And she's like, oh, yeah, what else? What else happened? How could you have handled that different? But, yeah, and it's all your answer. So the answers, you actually don't need counselling because the answers are in you already. That's Everyone has counselling now, don't they? But, like, you don't need it. It's so funny. Got, you've got the answers. You, you know you have too, but you just need to. <laughs> We're trained to think we need someone else to help us, I guess. And I mean, you do help, 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 sure, <laughs> obviously. But I think the answers are all at the end of the day. The answers are all in you. Aren't they? Yeah, I reckon the best thing I ever got out of God. I went to a I went to a counselor years ago, and mm. yeah, you're right. I had the answers in me, but it was just like the tools that he gave me. Have you heard of mm. CBT? It was like yeah. I was just getting stuck on like a negative loop in my head of just of yeah. just unhelpful thoughts. And mm. I guess um, it doesn't, I mean, it just adds to your point because he's like, no, no, but just because you're going around and around with that doesn't make that thought real. And I was like, mm. oh, yeah. He's like, why don't you try this thought? And I was like, well, that feels way better. And mm. yeah, you're right. But he just had to point his finger to it and go, oh, there, there it is. Or which is better than just going, oh, okay, so you just need a, I don't know, because I feel like there's a lot of people now who go, oh, I'm stuck on a bad thought. And they're like, oh, you should take this antidepressant. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. well, that's, I mean, maybe, but maybe. Maybe you should Maybe do what Billy Styles is saying. Just have a look at. Just stop thinking. You know the bad thought. Just stop thinking it. It's so like so helpful. <laughs> you know where because you know essentially we're nothing. So every thought you have is a made up construct. Like, oh, I'm not achieving enough in my life. Made up. I'm achieving everything I've ever needed to achieve right now. It does. It's all made up. Comedy's made up. Being a lawyer's made up. They're all made up. So. If you're depressed about that you didn't fail uni, don't worry about it. It's made up. <laughs> it's good, I heard Tucker Carlson on um, Theo Vaughn the up. other day. Yeah, Tucker Carlson Just on Theo Vaughn the other day. Don't feel bad yourself. Don't feel good about yourself. Don't, I mean, you need stimulation, but you don't. It's kind of, yeah, keep it simple. Anyway, sorry, go on. Nah, it's so true. Tucker Carlson said something similar on Theo Vaughn the other day. He's like, yeah, when you're an adult, you start making up this idea that you've got things together. He's like, people see you in your suit at your fancy job and your nice car, and they're like, oh, he's got it together. And you go to them, mm-hmm. yeah, I do have it together. He's like, no, you don't. He's like, mm-hmm. we're all just flying along by the seat of our pants, doing whatever we can to try and survive. And mm-hmm. you've got absolutely no idea and very little control of what's going on. And when you, mm-hmm. and it was, I can't remember whether he said this or whether it's just the conclusion I got to, but it's like, yeah, when you get to that point, you're like, oh, that feels like there's a massive weight off my back now. Yeah, you, you, I, feel, I think we almost get addicted to being disappointed or you get something. In, they say zero to seven, so where your kids are at now, is the most important time for them, how they're going to feel in years to come about themselves. So, yeah, you just, you've got bad programs running. So then that's all you've got to break from when you're young. And I've gone back and I've gone back and done hypnosis is where I talk to myself as a, as a kid. And you sit next to yourself and you say, what do you need? How do you... And this is all to help me now. You go, what do... you go to that kid, what do you need, mate? What, you know, what is it? What's bothering you? How do you need to be treated to be okay? And then the kid will say, well, whatever. Like, whatever you come up with, what you need at the time. And then the, and the hypnosis and meditation, they say, now that's what you've got to give yourself right now as an adult and then all your childhood trauma is gone you know and it worked <laughs> all this crap that i was carrying i don't have it anymore it was made up i made up that you know for instance someone didn't like you they, they didn't love you or whatever made up you made it up you ran with it and made it work whereas you could have just said to yourself what well, Oh, every you know, your love. That's it. End of story. Last time I caught up with you, we were outside um the Burgie, and you were telling me that um 
you had some back pain and then you just reframed yeah. the way you saw it. So you sound like you're going down this rabbit hole a little bit of just the power of your mind to influence certain situations. And you're like, it is funny, man. My mum the other day, she had to go and have a, um, I can't remember the name of the procedure, but essentially it had to look at the the health of her veins. They thought she might have had a mild heart attack. But, yeah. and, and as a result, she had, uh, sorry, in the lead up to that, she'd had this dull pain in her arm, like, and kind of like an ache. And she'd been reading yeah. about that, like a, a common after effect of a mild heart attack or a stroke is like a little bit of a dull ache in your left arm. And just, my mum was like, oh crap, I think it is this. And this is all evidence. Anyway, she went in, got this procedure done. The guy's like, mm-hmm. no, your, your heart, your veins, everything is as good as new. You look great. Mm-hmm. You're fine. Mm-hmm. And she reckons almost immediately that arm pain just, she's like, oh, I hadn't thought about it anymore. So there's definitely, there's definitely some kind of crazy impact that it has on yeah. like your physical health as well. All right. Well, I had first-hand experience of what your mum went through about 10, oh, maybe a bit more than 10 years ago. So I had a traumatic event happen to me. At Epping Plaza, where a guy chased me with an axe through the car park. What? And yeah, so a guy cut me off in my work van, and I'm like, "What's going on?" I was at the lights. What's this dude doing? And he reached into the back seat and he grabbed an axe, and he um, so he gets out of the car. I'm like, I didn't know it was an axe until he got out of the car and started walking at me like it was some kind of horror movie, <laughs> and I'm like. This dude's walking with a, carrying an axe across his body like that. And I'm like, oh, I've got to get out of here. This guy has an axe. <laughs> and I start, so I took off, man, on the wrong side of the road, spinning the wheels. The dude jumps back in his car and starts chasing me. And But I can't go anywhere because traffic's filled up. So I just went across the medium strip in the, in the middle. Man, the car was on two wheels my van and my work van and I smashed through trees to get in, back into the Epping Plaza car park. I had nowhere else to go. And the dude does exactly what I did. And I'm like, oh, this is a full-on car chase now. And there's a guy with an axe chasing me and I don't even know. I'm like, who is this? Like, like, what is this? And I'm just in total survival mode. And he comes, we're in Epping car park, like a big shopping center car park. He speeds past me, cuts me off again and gets out again with the axe. I'm in Epping plaza and i'm like shit this is full on but i'm more i'm remarkably calm because i'm seeing this i've never seen this before my brain doesn't know what to do my brain's like what do you do when an axeman's coming at you i've never had this i haven't practiced this (laughs) so i spin the wheels backwards this time into reverse and um, i think i hit like a trolley or something i'm like Oh, that wasn't a person. And then, and I and I went back the way I came in, jumped back over, like over. I'm I'm driving over like things that were way too high, and then you do what you do to survive. But then I got out to a paddock at it, past Epping out, and then things like the end of the suburbs. I mean, they're building up to that now, but back then there was paddocks, and I got into this paddock and just stuck down like I was in a movie, and um, I rang my boss and I'm like. I don't know if even know if he believed me. I said, mate, I've just been chased by a crazy <laughs> axe, axe man at Epping Plaza. I can't, I can't finish the day's work. I'm going home. And he goes, but you've still got stuff in the van. I go, I don't care, man. I just got chased by, like, what I do with an axe. And um, anyway, I was like, and then I got home and I was just laughing about it. I'm, I, was, I remember putting status up, like, something like, how was your day, guys? Anyone else get chased by a wild axe man? Is, the shopping center and I, so, so I thought it was pretty funny but then six months later i'm driving a warnable to see the girl i was seeing at the time and i just see headlights in my in my mirror and, and, and i'm like oh it's the guy like i haven't thought about it for six months and it just hits me oh that guy's coming to murder me so my brain had had my brain had had time to it, it, it didn't go away. It stuck in this. Your subconscious didn't know what to do with it at the time. And then six months later, it spat it out when I was growing a warning and I thought everyone was trying to kill me. From that day, I just thought everyone was that guy. So I'd be in a shop and I'd be like, looking over my shoulder. So I had post-traumatic stress. And then 
I didn't even put it together that it was from that kind of thing. I was just scared of life. And then then I started developing health anxiety where every ache, every pain was bad. Trauma um, was like, a, uh, what's the word? Uh, when it, fatal. So I started thinking every condition I had was fatal. I would go to the dentist with like jaw pain and I'd say, look, mate, I've definitely got like an abscess or something in this jaw. Um, can you check it out? I can't eat. I can't chew on that side. And then they'd x-ray me and he'd go, there's nothing there. And I'd walk out with no pain. And then other sh- other stuff, would ha- I'd have symptoms that weren't real. And he told me to stop Googling the guy, the doctor. And I did. But I had to get treatment yeah, for that. And that. But yeah, your brain, my brain was making up symptoms. You can make pain happen in your body. And, that, and we, oh, I'm back to that back thing with the back pain. So I was watching that SAS. Did I tell you that part of it? I don't think that, so. So there's, there's that show SAS where the special operations, they train them and they put celebrities on it and train them in that course. And um, Sabrina Frederick Traub, the footballer, the AFLW footballer was on it. And she goes, I can't, she was carrying like a backpack with like, 20 kilos or something up this hill and she goes to the instructor the SAS to like special operations guy army guy I can't go anymore my back is killing and and he goes he's screaming at her he goes it's all in your fucking head and she just kept going and I'm like what she couldn't even move and now she's running up the hill again and I went, what if my back pain's all in my head too? Because I had back pain every day. And I started telling myself that I had the strongest back in the world. And I've never had an injury since. <laughs> like, and, I, and, I, and ironically, you know, you, you manifest things into your life sometimes. You think, that just happened. Why did that just happen? You know, I'm running one day in Heidelberg in the parklands out the back. It's just on one of those dirt tracks where no one ever is. And Sabrina Frederick Traub runs past me, that girl. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, I was going to say, I, she, was, she must have been training for pre-season or whatever. I felt like saying, like, you, um, like that, that thing changed my life, just that little incident. You know what I mean? Just seeing her on that show. I wanted to say thanks for that. Because, like, even though she didn't, like, that guy made her run, but, like, she made me run. You know what I mean? And I wouldn't have been running if it wasn't for watching that show and finding out that. And my back, I mean, I've had moments where it's a bit stiff, but then I'm like, no, it's not. And it goes away. Most, I know you can get structural injuries, but maybe if you think differently, your body can fix itself or, or not even, or it's just a receptor that you've got firing off. Because you hear everyone, all you hear in life is everyone's got a bad back, everyone's got a bad what if that's just being created by you? Dude, it's such an interesting conversation as well because, like, there's definitely a massive relationship between your physical health and your mental health, but then mm. there's definitely a limit between imagining something and actually being able to manifest it. Like, there's, there's, some, there's some line somewhere where it gets real weird. Do you know what I mean? Like, you speak to the yeah. average person and they go, okay, so mental strength is important and you can create better health with your mind. And you're like, for sure. And then yeah, someone's yeah. like, well, I've imagined I'm a millionaire in Vanuatu by the time I'm 26, but I'm mm. 31 now, I still live in my car. So you're like, all right, what's happened mm. there? Why is, like, I, I yeah, can't right. remember who I heard. Yeah, I, I think Ricky Gervais has a joke about it, where it's like, yeah, that's why, that's why there's so many poor Africans, because they haven't heard mm. about the power of manifesting. They're just sitting there going, <laughs> oh, I wish I, had some, yeah. I wish I had some better food. And you're like, oh, not with that attitude, you're going to get absolutely fuck all. <laughs> But yeah, it is, dude. Like, I'm, I'm definitely no, I mean, want to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know about manifesting everything like that, but another one. I don't know. Just strange things happen in life that you think is so odd. Like the other day, I was on a, I was on a podcast with um, Ron Lewis and Brett Blake, and I said to them, it was about getting sacked from jobs and that. And I said, I got sacked from being a ball boy at Too Young. I left the scoreboard on the same score for about five minutes or whatever, and it was Wally Masur. <laughs> and it was Wally Masur versus Boris Becker. 
Anyway. Mate, it was your job to change the score. Yeah, but as a kid, and I got, they shouldn't have given me that job because <laughs> I started chatting to some kids in front of me and got distracted. But that's what you get when you pay someone $6 a day, isn't it? And they've got ADHD, but whatever. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I say, yeah, so they, they're like, who was playing? I'm like, it was Wally Masua, Boris Becker. And that night I'm doing a gig in Con Street and guess who's in there? Wally Masua. I'm like, come on, life. What are you, this is not real. Why is Wally Masua in my, you know what I mean? Like, I talked about him today and he's here now. I've never seen Wally Masua in my life apart from that day in 1987. <laughs> <laughs> and now, because I've mentioned his name and he's popped up, like, When's a coincidence a bit too freaky, you know what I mean? That's wild. Yeah, it is weird. It's very yeah, weird. You know, you I've got, had a few moments like that. Co- coincidence stories. Like, and the other day I met the Southern Suns lead singer and I just put his song in my Spotify list. And he was at my gig in this country town, population 100. And I'm like, <laughs> dude, I go, dude, what are you doing here? Like, he goes, yeah, I bought the church down the road. I'm like, I go, I just put your song in my Spotify the other day. Like, like, I'm trying to think like, I'm trying to think of a good one that I've had. I don't know. I wasn't thinking about this. Nah, I don't not that direct. Not that direct. I've met some cool people that I've just been shocked to say to see. I got off the flight from um Perth the other day and who was Michael Gardner? Do you mm. remember him? The big ruckman? Yeah, the big ruckman from Perth, yeah. Yeah, Did, did he? Cousins, mate. Yeah, I thought he was. I thought he had a bit of a wild, yeah, a wild, wild reputation. Yeah, dude. But um, he got I mean, he got... By, he got ambushed by the Western Bulldogs as an eighteen-year-old at the Western Oval one day. There's footage of it. Like, Liberatore and that ganged up on him, and yet, like, it was full on, and he was scared. Like, he looked visibly shaken. They got him. They're like, we're going to get this eighteen-year-old kid on his first game. Liber, Paul Dimatina, and I think Steve Credio. Yeah, remember those? Do you remember those times where Liver became a, like a tagger in '97 and that? Yeah, I've got vague memories of it. I don't remember the. Uh, I remember Liver just being a bloke that I was terrified of. I would see him run mm. around, and I'd be like, oh, even though he's so little, he's just one of those little bulldogs that you just know, um, you just know that you're not getting away with anything. And that was weird as well. Like even in '97, it had. It had probably cleaned up a little bit, but it was still a wild game in comparison to what it is now. So you could get away with so much. So he's the kind mm. of bloke that you go up for a mark and you can be you can be 15 seconds late and still cop it in the back and barely give away a free kick. But they really made you they really made you work for it back then. That's why I love looking at the old highlights of of people like um, Liberatore yeah. and and even BT. Like BT is so funny back in the day, just lining mm. up at full forward, celebrating goals before he'd even kicked them. Like yeah, there yeah. was something. Yeah, there's something appeal. That's like the the part of footy that international people really seem to connect with. It's a bummer we're we sort of ironing it out so much. There's no characters now. It's all athletes and um, uh, like where's the Alan? Yeah, like the full forwards in the early '90s and '80s, late '80s. Jakovic, Alan Jakovic. Um, not so. Dunstall was pretty boring, but he got the job done with goals. But then you had Modra, who was like a, a actual. Superhero over in Adelaide. Yeah, wow. Tony Modra looked like a superhero. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you had people like that, Lockett, Plugger, like there was characters in the game, like Plugger threw a crutch at Eddie McGuire's head. Remember that? Have you seen that footage? No. Nah. Eddie McGuire's trying to interview him when he's got an injury, and Plugger just picks up the crutch and throws it at Eddie McGuire. Like, I would love to throw a crutch at Eddie McGuire. I think a lot of people would, you know? <laughs> That's wild, taught, though, man. Yeah, yeah. My mum taught at Broad Meadows Primary um, School, one of the West Meadows Primary, or Meadow Bank Primary, actually, for 30 years. And Eddie McGuire's parents lived across the road. Uh, Scottish and English, I think they are. And um, she'd always see them out front. But she never saw him. Eddie was never there. What he I wonder what he's doing. Probably out in the footy yeah. oval. I don't know, probably in a, in a two-rack, you know what I mean? Who knows? He did pretty well out of life, Eddie, didn't he? You know, he's done well. He worked well hard for it, man. He still hosts Who Wants to Be a Millionaire 24 years later. Like, there's some things you look at and you go, okay, there, 
Like he clearly, this is paying well because there's no way in any other universe that Eddie Maguire is still hosting Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. No, it's a good, that's one of the best trivia gigs to get, isn't it? <laughs> it <laughs> would be. That. Not a bad one. I, Just whisper in the yeah. answers in your ear. Yeah, but I'm, like he's done well, good on him. Like I'm fascinated by people that make their life that good out of, I mean, from nowhere, you know what I mean? Like he's had some drive, hasn't he? Were you ever, because you played sport like me, were you fascinated by the ones that, that, that were right at the top of what's your over them and stuff like that? Oh, for sure. Like, I'm, so, I'm so fascinated with Nick Dacos at the moment, just because I always liked Josh. Josh and then yeah. Nick came in, and I heard rumours that Josh was – sorry, that Nick was a better player than his brother Josh. And I was like, oh, that's a big call, like, especially yeah. for a, a debut. And especially because you see so many – I don't know what he was drafted as. Like, I don't know if he was a number one draft pick. But I remember there's so many number no, one father, draft picks. It would have been father-son, so you don't so, – he avoids it. You skip the oh, draft okay. because – you know what I mean? Because your dad's day cost, you, they go, where does Collingwood just get to grab him? Oh, sure. Their, I think they might have to give up a pick. They can give up like a pick 78. So, you know what I mean? It's not like, yeah, I think father son, yeah. But yeah, I heard those rumours too that he was better than the other brother. and all. It's just interesting what drives people. And some people like, there's just such different factors that drive an athlete to, to different levels. And I always reckon... Some of it, like I would love to know who the exceptions to this rule are, because I'm sure there's plenty. But the younger brother factor, like I remember when I was a school teacher, you would always know who the younger sibling was because they were always a bit more lippy. Like they, you could tell mm. they'd been pushed around a bit and they had to fend for themselves a little bit more. Yeah. So, so there was that factor. But then, like I think Josh is five years older than Nick, and so mm. like if you're going to be rubbing shoulders with Josh and his mates, you're going to want to lift your game because like when you're yeah. 15 and when you're 10. Like, good yeah. luck trying to get a kick with your older brother's mates at that age. Like, you have to be desperate. But then just, like, the confidence that must come from seeing your old man just dominate the AFL back in the late 80s, like in Peter Dacos, you go, okay, there's something there as well. And then I yeah, even like heard... Like, it's normal. Here we go. Yeah. I even heard him in, like, a little interview that the Col Collingwood Footy Club did a while ago saying, all right, if you could sit down with four people at the dinner table, who would it be? And he was like, Novak Djokovic, LeBron mm -hmm. James... I can't remember who the other people were, but they were like elite mm. athletes. And he's like, oh, and I just remember thinking, okay, this guy's fascinated with, with what it means to be an elite athlete. Like he's, he's just mm. all in. And so I respect that as well. Um, but yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's something that not, not even just with athletes, just with people in every field. I'm like, comedy's weird as well. Cause you look at comedy and some people are like, like the Sam Kinnison's of the day, like, or mm. Richard Pryor. They're just like, absolute cokeheads, no no structure to their life and they're funny as. And then mm. you hear people like Joe Rogan who's like heaps of discipline, heaps of structure and still selling out arenas. You're like, there doesn't seem to be one one direct ticket hard to... Work. Generally hard work is the common denominator. Where those freaks, sometimes there's a freak that doesn't do it, but they're absolute freaks. Um, like Gary Ablett Senior, they reckon he used to turn up, not even do pre-season and then just <laughs> And then just beat everyone in every test, except for the long distance. They said he had no tank, but he didn't need it. They reckon they'd pull him out of the – like he'd be in a pie 10 minutes before he went on the field, and then he'd just be six in the first quarter. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, those freaks, I, I, I like, they're just born freak. Gary Albert Senior, even though Junior was a gun, Gary Albert Senior is – because I'm – with footy, I was like an obsessed kid that could kick left and right and all do all this. but. So I would only like the people that could do stuff I couldn't do. And Gary Abbasina was just one of those blokes that I'm like, oh, that guy can do, like, he can do it all, that guy. I, I remember they put him in the centre once against West Coast and he got 35, kicked five, and just won the match off his own boot. He'd never really played in the centre for a while, you know, like, and he could stand on the heads and take marks. There wasn't much he couldn't do, but yeah. They work, but, but as far as, yeah, most of the time it's work ethic. I mean, Joe Rogan, he's got bad work ethic, but they enjoy it. They enjoy the grind, whereas I didn't have work ethic. It's probably, I've got, I kind of try to apply it now to comedy a bit because I didn't do it for sport. Like, I didn't, it, it sounds stupid, but I, because I, when you, nat, when you have natural kind of ability, you don't think, you need to work and then yeah it's, i never put it together that 
I could have done both. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, for sure. I reckon this is, um, I used to always say, I say this now to athletes that I coach that I reckon um, just the ability to put in the hard work and be consistent is almost a talent in itself. And you always notice that like the most natural kids as juniors, they, they always seem, well, not always, but a lot of the time they seem to lack that work ethic for the reason you just explained. It's like, oh, I've got it. I've got what everyone's striving towards. Yeah, and well, then, why do I, if I'm winning best and fairest in under 10s, why do, why do I have to do the training? I'm not training now and I'm winning them. <laughs> but like, that was me. And then under, then when kids started growing and working harder, I'm like, why are they getting good and I'm not? So I'm just saying the same. You know what I mean? Mm. I didn't put it. I, you know, I didn't put it together, but um, yeah, it's it, it, that's what you look. I know. I look back now, and I'm like, I started a new pursuit, comedy, and I'm like, I got to do something different to make this work. And I'm trying to. I'm still lazy though. Like I still, I could be doing more a lot of the time. But, in what way? In I, what way are you lazy with comedy? Do you reckon? Writing, like, I'll. I'll sit down to write and I'll just draw pictures of old footy stadiums and that's still like I'm back at school for like four. And I'll just get out. I'll, 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 at the end of the session, I haven't written, I haven't even written one word, you know, or I've, or I've just started texting mates or talking about old songs. What do you think of this old song? And I just get distracted. But I think that's also what makes me, me a bit. So I can't really, like I can't be a robot, you know, and yeah. just, Oh, get up, get up at four, ride for two hours, meditate for 45 minutes, drink four litres of water, be grateful. I go nuts. <laughs> I got to eat a donut. I got to eat a donut. Like, I, like today I just got up and I'm like, I'm so, I felt a bit flat, so I just ate two sausage rolls, a can of Coke, and had a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> So like yesterday, I got blueberries and dark chocolates. I'm like, I'm gonna be healthy as today. Let's get some of, let's get some of that serotonin. But but today, it's funny when you're tired, you just go for it. It's like that's what I feel like I need. I don't know. I'm odd. Yeah, man. it you is know, weird, pretty, man. Like you're pretty structured, right? In your life. Yeah. So yeah, I am with with a lot of things. Like I, yeah, I, I'm fascinated by this subject just because. Like, it's not always the most disciplined person who's the funniest or the fastest or whatever. Like, I used to look at runners and I'd be like, all right, so the Kenyans run 150K a week. So if I run mm. 200K a week, that means I'm going to be better than the Kenyans. And then mm. you start trying to do that and you start getting stress fractures. You're like, okay, well, there's a limit here to, like, it's not always the, like, mm. there's a Canadian guy called Cam Myers. And Cam yeah. Myers in high school or college was known for running like 300Ks a week and doing yeah. three runs a day, and he was very good, but yeah. he would get his ass kicked by Kenyans who are doing half the amount of training. And I'm often like, all right, like, sure, natural talent's a thing, mm. putting in the work's a thing, but then there's other factors like um, just being able to rock up with enthusiasm and joy for it. And that's where mm. I always, like, I'm trying to find the, the balance between, I feel like the sweet spot for me with comedy is if I can do four gigs a week, I feel mm. like I'm pumped to get up every time. Like, I feel yeah. like I'm ready to go. I bring like a good energy. But if I start doing, I know some people, they like to do 10 or, or whatever and good on them. Like, mate, and some people work better off that. Mm. But I'm always like, oh, I feel like if I did 10, I start sacrificing other things in my life that actually makes my tank feel full and makes me love comedy. So I just start going to comedy mm. being like, ah, oh, like, yeah, so I don't grind. know, man. It's a, it's it's a weird, um, yeah, weird. I was grinding the last month or two doing heaps of gigs and stuff. And then for the last two weeks, I looked at the diary and there wasn't even much in there. But I didn't even, sorry, I straightened that up. I didn't even bother finding more gigs. I just went, have a rest. It felt like I had to have a rest. Because I was getting, I was just grinding. I didn't want to go. I was tired. Yeah, it's hard. It's a balance. But then well, once again, it comes back to that thing that everything's made. You make up every belief in your head. So you go, those people that do 10 a week, they're like, I have to do 10 a week. They've got that belief that they have to do 10 a week. But you can have the belief that you only have to do four. And it's the same thing. Your brain just goes, yeah, oh, that's all I need to do to be sharp. Or like Roger Federer doesn't train the same way or didn't train the same way Djokovic and Nadal do. And they've, both, they've all got the same result. 
So yeah, it's it's you got to train an acceptable amount, but it, yeah, it's it's there's no exact science to it. With the with the Kenyans and the African runners and that, like, do you just think they're just genetically better? From yeah, I think, history, I think they... their history of like would it be their do you reckon it's their history of like how they live? Man, I reckon it's a combination of factors. I reckon it's so many things. Um, so like <clears throat> I was talking to a guy on my running podcast recently, and this is the newest thing that I've been thinking about, and it makes so much sense. Like if you look at my, my face shape and like my jaw structure and stuff like that, you can pretty clearly see on my mum's son. Like you look at my mum, you look at him, you go, Oh yeah, I get that. Like they they you, they got some pretty common features. You look at the Kenyans and, bro, since the 60s, probably yeah. even before that, like, um, they were still running, obviously, but they weren't competing necessarily. Like, they were, but you know what I mean? Not like they are now. Since the 60s, these guys, like, they look at their dad and their dads are world champions. And if their dad wasn't a world champion, it was their neighbor or it was their friend's dad or whatever. So you wake yeah. up, you're like, all right, so I'm a Kenyan. Like, Kenyans dominate this sport. And to what you were just talking about then, you're like, all right, so I've got. Factor one, tick, I'm a Kenyan. Like, that's a pretty good place to start. Or I'm an East African. Mm. And then not to mention the fact that their, like, their lifestyle is so different to the way that we live as well. Like, they're, they're, mm. they're not civilized to death like we are. Like, it's not just, okay, wake up, go to work, come home, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's a mm. much more relaxed kind of a lifestyle. They mm. seem to have more rhythms in their life as well. And mm. then, so there's that. But then, like, if you look at, if you look at the average running group in Melbourne, there might be mm. like eight people going out for a jog, and that's cool. Dude, you mm. look at the morning runs going out of some of the training camps. I'm not kidding. There's 300. And mm. in those 300, 50 of them have run two hours eight or faster. And so you can run two hours eight, which is pretty much 30 seconds short of the Australian record, and you're 50th in your group in your town. And so you're like, all right. Hard. It'd be hard to make the Kenyan national team. Dude. It? Dude. They'd have people. They'd have people. They'd have people ranked 50 in their suburb that to be you. In the, oh, in the... with that, bro. <laughs> that have people, that have people 500th in their suburb that would make you look like a be, bitch. You'd be close to the best runner in Queenscliff. Probably, you'd have to be the best in Queenscliff, wouldn't you? Surely, yeah. if there's someone beating well, me in yeah, Queenscliff, Boydy, <sighs> Boydy, wouldn't get close. Boydy can run pretty quick, but he wouldn't get close to you. But so you'd be the best in Queenscliff. But in Queenscliff suburb in Africa, there'd be like 10 dudes that can beat you. Probably. Dude, there'd be way more than 10 dudes that could beat me in Queen's Bay version of Africa. And girls. girls and too. girls as well. The only thing, so yeah, there's so many factors. The only thing that's, um, they've recently discovered EPO. So there's a lot of Kenyans getting pinged for EPO at the moment, which is wow. which is a lot newer. Like there's a lot. Every every couple of weeks, there's another Kenyan coming out. Someone then, else has put, but like no one from Kenya is putting them on EPO. That'd be like someone from there, like from wherever they live now, wouldn't it? Like. I don't know, man. I don't know. I reckon they're ca I reckon they're catching up with the times. They've got some pretty high profile coaches over there now who are pretty westernized in terms of the so, so where do the Africans that are good sprinters come from? Is that like Zan uh Frankie Fredericks and Z is it Zambia and um, Yeah, where was was know, he he was Zimbabwe or something random, wasn't he? Where was I mean, Frankie Z Fredericks from? Zambia, Africa. Uh, Zambia. Frederick. Let me just find out Frankie Fredericks, uh, where he's from. Because that's a, that's a name I haven't heard for a little while, actually. Uh, Frankie Fredericks. Um, where are we going here? Yeah, uh, Frankie. Frankie Fredericks. Dude, he's, a, he's a blast from that. Zambia, Namibia, something like that. Uh, Fred, former track and field medalist. Where's it? Namibian. Namibia, yeah. So, yeah, yeah he's at Africa. Yeah. Where is Namibia? Um, <laughs> Dude, I've got no idea where Namibia is. Yeah, I'm going to Google that, it. But isn't that the West Africans are sprinters? Is that right? Southern Africa. Say that again, sorry. So there's a part of Africa that sprinters come from, which is another thing, isn't it? Like, Yeah, well, it... dude, I don't, you're actually testing me here because there's not that many, like in terms of, if you look at the start line of a 100-meter Olympic final, you, you might see one or maybe two Africans. Yeah. Like they're usually yeah. Jamaican and American, and there's a couple of British, and they're all yeah. black. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. There's always like a random. Um, there's a couple of like there's a couple of Kenyan sprinters coming through who have broken ten yeah. seconds now, which oh, yeah. I mean isn't what it was back in 1999, but it's still bloody fast, obviously. 
Um, yeah. yeah, where are where are the Ken- the the African sprinters from? I'm not 100 percent sure. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. know. I mean, who is so who's one? Of, oh, you saying Bolt? Where's he from? He's Jamaica. Jamaica, oh, is he? Yeah, so that's the Caribbean. It's, is that near Africa? Dude, map? that's a great question. I got to get a where map you, up. Like, get a map up. Can you get one? I want to know where. I want to know where Jamaica is compared to Africa. Like, is it? Let me try and. The... I'll do a screen share with you. Give me one sec. I'll s- share that. I'm going to open up a tab here. <laughs> All right. What are we looking at? A world map. See, this is the beauty of technology. Tell me again. where Jamaica. Tell me where Jamaica is compared to at those. To, compared to Kenya. I want to know. All right. Maps. I've just written world map Jamaica. Oh, here we go. All right. I'll share this with you, brother. Mm-hmm. Um, share a window. Oh, screen. All right. Here we oh. go. Give me one. Oh, oh far wow. I've just mirrored myself there. Can you see that? Yeah. So what's that? There we go. So that's what Jamaica. That's an so there's Jamaica. Where's um? Like I'm trying to zoom out on it like it's my thing. I can't. Oh, dude. So it's between. Okay. So this is embarrassing. This is this is a. Uh, so it's what? between Brazil and. So where's Africa? So where's where's it's where's? nowhere near Africa. What? <laughs> Wait, is it, is it, it? What's over here? Okay. So here we go, bro. So this right. Can you see my little cursor? Yeah. So that's that's Jamaica right there. Hmm. There's the USA. There's South America. Bro, Africa's a six hour flight away. It's not that far though, is it? Like six hours. It's not much. Really. I guess when you think about the fact it's a four hour flight to Perth. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of Oh yeah. It's kind of west so it's west of Africa, right? Yeah. They say the West Africans go to the West, go back to Africa. What are the West African countries called? Let's go back. Can you get what do we got? Zoom in on Africa. And what are the ones in the West? What countries are on the West side? All right, here we go. We've got Morocco. Yes. I reckon they got sprinters. Who else? See, Morocco, yeah, Liberia. I'm not 100% sure. The Gambia. Ghana. I reckon, I reckon I... Ghana might have a couple of sprinters. Where's um, Merlin Oddy from? Ah, uh, dude. Far out. I do remember that. That's yeah, dude. I remember. She's a little bit Merlin Oddy. I'm I'm googling that on my phone right now. Merlin. She, she competed till she was like 45, didn't she? Yeah, she competed for a few countries though, but her original country, I want to know what that was. Merlin. She was a sprinter. Let's have a little Google now. Merlin. She came back at 48, I think. Dude, that was ridiculous. Remember um, the swimmer Dana Torres come back 16 years after? Do you remember what? that? What? So after this, Google Dana Torres, Torres but tell me where Merlene Oddie's from. Dude, Merlene Oddie is, uh, it says here that she was born in Hanover Parish, Jamaica. Jamaica. So Jamaicans are legit fast. That's official. I feel she never like won before... gold. She never won yeah. gold, though, I don't think. Dude, I'm opening up her Wikipedia page now because I know very little about it. Is that right? She's 63 now. Yeah, and I reckon she went to the Olympics wow. at 48 for another com- representing another country. Yeah. Have a look, have a look at her Olymp- Olympics history. The last one will be from like... Slovenia, country, maybe? Slovenia, yep. Something like yeah, that. It says here, it says here, Jamaican Slovenian. Man, that's 15 mm. years ago that she... Because I remember Olympics. when she came back as a 48-year-old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's weird that so, she's 63 now. So Google Dana Torres, right? She's a swimmer from America. I'm pretty mm. sure she went to the 84 Olympics and the 2000 and maybe even the 2008 Olympics, dude. So she had like a so she had like a 28 year gap or something like and she won medals at all of them. Dude, she's stunning. Yeah. So have a look at her have a look at her medals though, how far apart they are. Okay, what do we got here? So she's born in 67. Like Cuz I love a good comeback, you know what I mean? That's as you get old, uh, as you get older, you like you want to know older people can still do stuff. Man, it's the story of my life. I was constantly looking at the progress of young athletes, um, yeah, yeah, like seeing how fast they ran at my age. All right, Dana Torres, born in '67, American competitive swimmer who's 12-time Olympic medalist. Okay, 12-time yeah. Olympic medalist. Uh, okay, here we go. Represent United States in five Olympic Games: '84, '88, '92, '2000, yeah. and 2008. Yeah. So she's had two comebacks, dude. 
Like she's at, that... so she can't, she had a gap between 2000 and 2008. And I reckon 2008, she may have won a medal, man. Like that's, that is that's, wild, isn't it? She's, I think she's the best comeback story because I, I'm pretty sure in 2000 she had a better Olympics than 84. And swimming's notorious for you got to retire young. <laughs> but I heard an inter- interview with Kelly Slater recently, and he's 53, I think. Still 53. 50, yeah, 51 maybe. Yeah, he's he's quite. I mean, he's he's over fifty, um, and he was saying I can't remember who he was talking to. Oh, um, Hickson Gracie said to him like fifteen years ago or ten years ago, "Oh, mm. dude, like you should you should hang up the you should hang up the boots now because you've had an incredible career. Go out on top." He said he saw him five years later and he'd won two more world <laughs> surfing titles, mm. and he's like, "I'm so glad I didn't listen to your advice." Yeah, you can do. It's pretty. That's like you, yeah, you can kind of do what you want. People try and tell you you can't do stuff. Um, who was the one? Mark Spitz won seven Olympic golds in '72, I think, at Munich, or Montreal, Munich. And he tried to come back in 2000 or '96 or something like that. And he was swimming the same times as a 50 year old, but he couldn't make the team anymore because the times. But he was still swimming fast, but it's That's real hard wild. to make it. Yeah, he tried to do it. I think someone paid him to try and make the comeback, but you haven't got the same hunger. Plus, he was old, so. Janet Evans, she was one of the best of all time, and she she couldn't make a team when she tried to come back as well. She was unbeatable at one stage. It, there would be no one who matches your sporting trivia, would there? Is there anyone who can sit down and, and, and riff with you? As You've got incredible, um, like all sports as well. It doesn't matter, tennis, swimming, football, track yeah, and field. I take in stats and I take in things that are important, and they say, yeah, I'm fast because I've got an in, uh, interest in it. Um, it stays in my head. Someone said once that I've got the best footy knowledge of anyone they've ever met. Like I should be a commentator or something. They said. You should be a special comments guy. Like get rid of yeah. Dark or something and just go, yeah, I mean, like it was great what Jamie Elliott just did, but remember what BT did back in 1981? Kicked a goal yeah. up at the siren to win by four points. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like I did a, I did a gig at Our Lady College for girls' school in Heidelberg and I was sitting at like a dinner table and I start chatting to this guy and I'm saying, oh, do you ever play sport and stuff? And he goes, oh, yeah, I played for Melbourne Tigers and Canberra Cannon. And I just started reeling off names from the old NBL and the dude was like, wow, I can't remember you remember that, dude. Like, and I don't know what, it's maybe like a spectrum thing with me, but I've always had it. My uncle used to sit me on the bar stool at the MCG Hotel when I was 10 and because I'd read the record, or the footy record all day, I'd study the numbers, I'd study how tall they were, and he'd say to these drunks, Hey, I bet you ten bucks you can't confuse you can't ask my ask my nephew any whose number whatever for any club in the league and and they'd say, Oh, who's number thirty two for Hawthorne? and I'd just say, Oh yeah, Colin Robertson. And me my, my uncle would just pocket money all night. <laughs> these drunks were just betting and I'm ten years old drinking lemon squashes on the stool. You're just a hustler. Yeah, and he'd keep me there till like eleven at night and I'd just I'd have because every time he got a beer, he'd get me a lemon squash, and I just couldn't get him down anymore. So then <laughs> I just was full of soft drink, and I'd go back to my granny's joint where my uncle lived, and my mum would be like upset because my uncle took me to the footy, and we're not, it's, it's 11 at night, we're not home yet. You know? <laughs> he's, got me, he's, got me, he's got me at the pub betting with like drunks. <laughs> you had 18 lemon squashes. <laughs> yeah, and he's, but he's pocketed about 200 bucks, you know, he's making oh. money off me. Oh, dude, so, that's um, so funny. Yeah, but yeah, I've always had, I've always had that, that knowledge. Of, of, uh, I buddy in on people when I hear it. Sometimes I'm like, I'll hear someone in a you know, conversation talking about sport, and I'll just, I'll just yell out the correct stat and walk off. <laughs> <laughs> that's go, so nah, good. You, I go, it wasn't him. You'll find it was someone, someone else. <laughs> I just can't let them think it's the wrong person. <laughs> there was a, there's a kid at a school I used to teach at, and I remember the first day I got there, he goes, he came up, he goes, "What's your birthday?" And I was like, "That's nice." Like this kid, is just desperate to know my birthday, he wants to find out about me. And mm. I told him, and dude, that was the only time I ever talked to him. He was a little Asperger's kid. He came back to me mm. nine months later, and every now and then I'd just walk past him and go, "Hey, what's like?" I'd look at another kid in the playground, and go, "What's their birthday?" And he'd be like, "Oh, fifth yeah. of March, nineteen whatever." And I'd go over yeah, to the kid yeah. and go, hey, what's your birthday? He goes, oh, 5th of March. I was like, it's unbelievable. Like, there's 200 yeah, kids yeah. in this school. Yeah, I didn't, yeah. And because he's in, they're just naturally interested in, like, 
even when you said your old man played footy, or I watched something you were on once, and your dad was on it, and he mentioned oh, with the Phil Smith. So then I just went down a half an hour rabbit hole on your old man's footy career. So I probably know more about your dad's footy career than you. Dude, I bet you do. I bet you do. <laughs> like he was down at playing down at Gippsland, and there was articles written on him and that. Like he's a good on baller. Dude, he'll love that as well. He'll love that. The fact that Billy Styles, Australia's best comedian, saying to him, "I know about your, I know about your footy career." Play footy with Jeff Jennings, like against him, and and he was in interleague sides. Your old man, so he's all right, mate. Dude, you're um, you're you're above and beyond my level. But I just naturally, I'm like, oh, I've got to find out, and I know, and you're, and I look up your running time, so I, yeah. so I've got that in my head. <laughs> I, I just, I just compile knowledge, mate. You know, like that. You know how we got talking about when me and you met, when I'm, and I went straight into um, Steve Prefontaine's story. Couldn't believe so it. I spent like a whole week just absorbing Steve Prefontaine information. I, I ran out of stuff on the internet. I, I, was, I got it all. Like I, <laughs> I watched both movies. I watched both movies about him, and then in the end, I couldn't find any more information on him. You know, Dude, so... that's awesome. I love it. It must be so interesting, I reckon. Like, I, I hear people like that. I go, I'd just be so interesting to be. I love that curiosity. I love it when people are just so naturally curious about whatever it is that they're doing. Like, they just mm. go around. Like, my kid's like that. He walks around. He's like, Dad, what's that? I'm like, it's a brick. He's like, awesome. That's so yeah, good. But, yeah. And then on the flip side, though, if someone's talking about politics, my brain just goes to sleep. You know what For I mean? For sure. Yeah, it has to be on the, like, um, who, on the spectrum of who interest. Who was prime minister in 1996? I'm like, no idea. Yeah, you know, I like, think it was. Yeah, my brain hasn't even got to impress you. It hasn't got it in me to even look for the result. I don't care. <laughs> but, but but who won the reserves goal kicking? You know, in 1982. Yeah, I'm all over it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, bro, I'm. Um, I've got to. I've got to love you. Leave you in a minute because I'm going to Leopold to have a coffee with a mate before I drive down to Melbourne tonight and try and get a gig. I'm going to go to the That's lounge right. tonight because I think um Ev Hocking right. and. Tommy Seagitter on if you if you're around. Yeah, Dan Con- Dan Connell. I might yeah, I might I've got dirty secrets and I might, I said I'd go up, but I'll probably might come over. I reckon we've got oh, about another sweet. ten we've got another ten podcasts in this, I reckon. Like Oh I just feel like I'm getting warmed up. Nostalgia. It's 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 For sure. it. But yeah, no, good chat, man. And I'll um Yeah. I might see you tonight. I'll shoot your message. No worries, man.